Okay, good day, everybody. I trust you are good wherever you are. Um, welcome to this webinar, which is part of EM Lyon's series of webinars on acceleration and transformation of business in the light of COVID-19. My name is Simon Chadwick. I am professor of uh, Eurasian Sport at EM Lyon Business School, and I will be taking you through today's presentation. As people uh, get ready for the webinar, may I share my screen with you and uh, take you to the slide presentation that uh, that we are going to uh, we're going to use today. Okay, so the reason that I've chosen this uh, this title "Swoosh Accelerating to a New Normal" is because I think very quickly we have moved in sports to a position that is considerably different to the um, the position we've been in before. Uh, and we've done that very, very quickly over a relatively short period of time. And, and so what I'm gonna do today is, is really to talk through, I think the last eight or nine months and provide an insight into what I think has been happening and and, and really chart the journey of, of, of sports response to the virus, not, not in a huge amount of detail, but certainly in terms of, I think, general principles. I plan to speak for about 20 minutes and then it will be over to you to uh, to ask some questions. Um, you're very welcome to to, to post questions in the uh, in the chat forum, and the the remainder of the hour will hopefully be spent uh, talking. Obviously, can I can answer questions, but it may be that uh, you can answer some of those questions as well. Just a little bit about me. Um, I'm sure some of you will know already who I am. For those of you who don't, um, this is what I do. Uh, I spend a lot of my time looking at uh, Eurasia and Eurasian sport. So in other words, anywhere between Reykjavik and Tokyo, uh, so China, Russia, South Korea, India, um, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, France, Britain, and so on and so forth. And, and my background is uh, commercial sport, but also increasingly looking at sport in terms of politics too. So I, I guess the way in which to summarize my interest is, is the political economy of sport. <clears throat> For those of you who want to get in touch, uh, my email address is there. After the webinar is finished, you, you're welcome to, to get in contact with me. Um, if you want more of the same, then my my Twitter uh, my Twitter handle is there. So, when I was a child, there was a film. When I was a, when I was a kid, there was a black and white film. So that shows you it was in the 20th century. Um, it was called the the day the Earth stood still. And some of you may know this film because it was remade uh, about. 10, 15 years ago. Um, but when I was a kid, this black and white film, The, the Day the Earth Stood Still, uh, really scared me to death. I, I used to get so frightened watching it because I, I, I couldn't believe that the, the Earth could be so traumatically affected by an event. And, and so when the, uh, when the pandemic kicked in earlier this year and, and, and as I began to, to kind of comprehend and contemplate what was happening, this, this 1950s American black and white film um, uh, came to my mind. But for me, I, I always think in terms of the day the earth stood still this year was 30th of January. Um, and I know it wasn't. I, I, I know that for many people it started a little earlier, for some people it started later. Uh, but what seemed to, to, to me to be happening, particularly because a lot of my work is based around uh, uh, Asian markets, is the earth seemed to have stood still. And towards the end of January, I was actually uh, on, a, on a, a continental um, air trip. So I traveled outside Europe and, and I went to a major air hub. And I took a look around at people coming from all over the world and thought, this will not continue for very much longer. There's no way it can continue. And the consequences of what's happening right now in front of my eyes, in other words, planes from all over the world landing, I thought is, is going to have serious ramifications. And obviously it did. And what subsequently happened is the pandemic came. It came to France, where I work. It came to my home country, Britain. We went into lockdown. And very early in, in the pandemic, I was invited by the University of Arizona, or should I say Arizona State University, to take part in a roundtable discussion. And what I did at that roundtable discussion was, was to offer a view that was being discussed in Britain at that point, that somehow 
the pandemic would be a reset moment for sport. It really struck me that some of the people uh, who were there that day as part of that panel, which was, was being staged online, as you might imagine already at the start of April, um, were really taken by this idea that somehow this, this, um, this circuit breaker, as we, we now know sometimes it's called, of, of there being no sport and, and people not moving around, et cetera, et cetera, would lead to us somehow going back to a golden age. But I sat and thought about this and, and, and I, I thought, well, is this really what's going to happen? Is it, is it really the case that instead of this commercially driven, market led uh, approach to sport that many countries across the world have become used to uh, over the last, certainly over the last 10 years, but arguably over the last 20 or 30 years, is that really where we're going to go back to? Are we going to find ourselves in January 2021 somehow living in 1950, the 1950s um, and possibly watching the day the earth stood still again in black and white? And, and I wasn't convinced by this. So then around this time, around the time of the, the, uh, the round table and around the time of people talking about the reset moment, I started to work through in my mind what I thought would could happen in due course. So this is just from my Twitter timeline in April. And, and you'll see that the first scenario that, that I potentially saw was, OK, we may go back to you know, the 1950s or the 1960s or the 1970s or you know, maybe even the 1990s. But then I also conceived of two other alternatives. So. Second one was that we would somehow go, go back to what we'd known before. But then there were two other alternatives. There were two other scenarios that loomed large in my mind. And one was we, we, we'd move forwards into the future, into an environment whereby the strong had survived and not only survived, but it got stronger. And some of the weakest in sport had fallen by the wayside. The other, the other scenario I contemplated is, is that we would see um, new new sports, or should we say existing forms of sport that perhaps weren't as mainstream as potentially they could have been, accelerating forwards and occupying the conscience of, of, of people. But I also thought too that, you know, I wonder if we're going to see new forms of consumption, because obviously even in April, when I think even in April, people were already gorging on Netflix box sets and, and so it was becoming apparent that even you know, something so simple as watching TV or listening to content on, on a radio or on a, on a laptop or a mobile, mobile device, even in April, that was very, very rapidly beginning to change. So by the end of April, um, when I was interviewed by India Express, I thought what was becoming very apparent is, is that we were heading to uh, three and four and that one and two here were less likely. Now, it's interesting because they, when India Express in, interviewed me, they asked, uh, is this the same as 2008, the, uh, the global financial crash? And my view at that time was no. And my view still is no, it's not the financial crash. Because I think what the financial crash did in 2008 was to moderate behavior. And what I mean by that is, is if you look at, for example, sponsorship, um, by 2009, 2010, I think sp uh, sponsorship managers, sponsorship directors, were being called to account much more. Um, they were being called to justify expenditure they had made uh, on sponsorship in, in a way that perhaps they previously hadn't. But I think fast forward 12 years to 2020, and this is not about calling people to account. I think for me, it's, it's, it's actually fundamentally, and, and at, at times has been existential, it's been an issue of whether or not sports uh, sports organizations, sports clubs, sports grounds, sports facilities would even survive, let alone be be moderated. And so what really this has done, I think, is, is, is really fast forwarded us, it's ca catapulted us, it's accelerated us, which is, after all, the, uh, the theme of this webinar series. It's accelerated us forward into um, a new reality. And, and I think Probably one of the first things that caught my attention in this new reality was Lando Norris, the McLaren F1 driver, racing in a simulator against Formula One fans. So no races, no spectators. But my goodness, in terms of uh, a, a, an experience, in terms of um, collaborative consumption, in, in, in terms of uh, 
co-creation of content, um, you know, that kind of Lando Norris simulator race against fans was, I thought, was absolutely striking. And as we know, subsequent to that, we did see, for example, virtual races in Formula E taking place. Many of us will know, and we keep on hearing this, um, and, uh, but it's, it's there and it's happening. And no, no matter how much we resist this, you know, we've seen over the last six months a massive rise in, in, in esports. Uh, we had the League of Legends World Championship final taking place in Shanghai uh, during October. But we're talking about audiences now, online audiences of 100 million plus. So what this is really, what the pandemic, I think, has really done is, is these things that we knew were happening already, they've been really uh, driven forwards, they've accelerated forwards. But it's not just a case of, of, of new sports and new ways of consuming sports. I think in the old world of sport, we've seen some interesting moves. Uh, there are lots of examples. I'm going to choose one or two just to illustrate. Uh, I think one of them was Project Big Picture in the, uh, with the English Premier League. We could probably talk quite a lot about this. Um, but in essence, this was about the powerful seeking to exert their power to exit the pandemic in an even more powerful position. And I know a lot of people might accuse the league itself. A lot of people might accuse the, the, the clubs that were involved in Project Big Picture. But as I say, and I reiterate, this is just one example because I think the same pattern we also have seen across other sports as well. Also for football, we, all, we also... Um, some of you will also be familiar with City Football Group uh, and what has happened with City Football Group this year. So keep in mind, you know, across football worldwide and across sports worldwide, we've seen bankruptcies. Uh, if we look at China, for example, sev several professional football clubs have gone out of business. Same is true in Europe. Um, we've also seen organisations furloughing their staff. If you're unfamiliar with this term furlough, it's essentially the, the staff are not at work. And certainly in the British case, the government, government making a, a financial contribution to the payment of the, the salaries of these workers who are not at work. So whilst lots of organisations have struggled, not just in sport, but across a range of industrial sectors, City Football Group went and bought two new franchises, one in Belgium, one in France. So rather than being, rather than being on the back foot not just City Football Group, but others too, were on the front foot and were actually proactive, dynamic, some might even say aggressive in using the pandemic as an opportunity to grow, to develop and to strengthen their power even more than they, they had power already. Nowhere is this true, I think, is, is, than, in, than in China. And it's not just about clubs and teams and, and football. I think one of the things that, that some observers will have already seen is, is that throughout the pandemic, again, not just in football, but across industrial sectors, China has used the opportunity of the pandemic to exert its position. And if you keep in mind that, that China probably now is maybe three or four or five or possibly even six months ahead of where we are in Europe, this gives China the opportunity to begin to flex its sporting muscles. And, and so what I found particularly uh, uh, intriguing was the announcement of the, the Lotus Blossom Stadium in Guangzhou, which will be the world's largest purpose-built football stadium when it's finished. Uh, this will probably form the, 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 the basis for a, a China World Cup bid, maybe 2030, maybe 2034. But I find it very interesting that China used the pandemic as the opportunity to announce the, uh, the construction or the, the start of the construction of this stadium. But it's not just coming out of uh, China and Europe. I think we've also seen some very interesting things happening in the United States as well. We've certainly seen a, an investment surge. I've talked quite a lot already about, about football, but I'll continue in that vein because <clears throat> certainly in France, also in Italy, we've seen considerable uh, US investment into French and Italian football during the, uh, the, the period of the pandemic. Um, so we've seen obviously clubs like uh, uh, AS Roma and Parma as well. Um, they, it is likely that 10%, maybe more of, of Serie A itself will be sold to an American investor. And we've also seen the rise of, of uh, the phenomenon of, of SPACs. 
uh, and perhaps we may, we might talk a little bit about uh, SPACs a little later on. Um, but some people in the room today may be familiar with the Red Bull SPAC, which has been uh, established by Billy Bean, um, the, the Moneyball uh, guru. And, and essentially what is happening in the United States is, is, is again, I think investors have, have, been, have been using the weaknesses inherent within the market to really exert their position as, as the year has gone on. So what has this all meant? Well, I, I th in simple terms, the big have got bigger, the rich have got richer, the, the smaller and weak sports, the smaller and weaker sports clubs, organizations um, have become weaker. And, and in one sense, what we're therefore beginning to see is, is that uh, some of the older and smaller, smaller sports are now being challenged. Their, their, their very existence is being challenged. And I think there is a real existential crisis ahead for, for some of them. Um, but what we're also seeing is huge polarization because if we look at the investment taking place into, as we've already said, the likes of Italian clubs by American investors, we, we know that, that at the top end of the, uh, the industry, uh, there's still money. There, there is still a view that, uh, um, that there is value to be derived, that there are, there are new revenue sources to be, uh, uh, to, to be engaged with. And I think one of the things that, that, um, that I would particularly highlight is, is for me, what has happened during the, the last eight months is, is the convergence of sport and entertainment has really uh, intensified. And there are lots of rumors around acquisitions and content, and, and, and we can perhaps in the discussion later talk about some of these examples. Um, but for those of you who watched the Jordan documentary on Netflix, that's a prime example. For those of you who've been watching the Tottenham do documentary on Amazon, you know, this is the prime example. For those of you who've heard about uh, heard words like the Disneyfication of sport, um, this is the essence of what has been happening this year. It was already happening, but I think it's intensified as the year has gone on. So wh where does that leave us? What, what is this new normal? Well, I think it's a new normal of industrial concentration where significant proportions of, of, of different sports are now being dominated by a very small number of organisations. I think that raises all manner of, of different issues around governance. Uh, I haven't even mentioned uh, Saudi Arabia and Newcastle United, but clearly the, the proposed acquisition of Newcastle United by Saudi Arabia, which became incredibly fractious, um, really did raise all manner of, of, of governance issues. And, and again, I don't think those governance issues are restricted solely to, uh, to, to football. If we think about esports, for example, and digital sport, I even had a conversation mid-year with someone about cyborg sport, um, and, and that really did raise all manner of issues around governance. So I, I think we're, we're, we're now uh, living in a very new era with lots of new questions, and, and it does raise issues about whether the existing forms of governance that we have are, are robust and fit for purpose. There's something around intervention and free markets. Uh, obviously, China, the, the, the Gulf region, um, still investment driven by the state, whereas obviously coming out of the United States, and we mentioned Red, the Red Bull SPAC, for example, very much free market. So I think there is an ideological uh, battle now intensifying uh, consumers. And, and, and I, I, it occurred to me that back in the old days, when I sat in front of a TV or when I went to a football stadium, or for that matter, when I went to watch a motor race or a cycling race, how little control I had over what I was watching. Uh, essentially, I, I was fed this. Um, and now, uh, and again, it was already happening, but it's intensified this year. If you think about the variety of different consumption choices, the modes of different consumption, uh, the different motives that we might have. So some of us might watch TV. We might have a mobile device. Uh, uh, we might have a laptop. I'm sat here today with two lap laptops and a mobile phone. So I'm actually teaching a, or I'm delivering a webinar with three three devices in front of me. So we're, we're living in a very um, dynamic technological environment in which lots of things are changing and lots of questions are being raised. That then leads into issues around new products, new consumers, new organizational forms. And, and, and I think, too, there's also an interesting issue around targeting and positioning in the sense that as we move forwards from here, I, I, I think that what even those smaller sports organizations are going to have to do, those that were threatened, they're going to have to start thinking much more about 
consumers and who they are and where they are and how to position brands and businesses and organizations and how you meet the needs of very specific groups of people. And, and I think this is especially so. One of the conversations that I've had repeatedly this year is how small, how small sports organizations can survive and compete. And, and I hope that these small organizations can learn, they can transform. Um, but one, one aspect of what they're gonna have to, to do, what they're gonna have to learn, what they're gonna have to transform into is a much stronger sense of targeting and positioning. Not everybody, not everybody, not every football fan wants to watch Real Madrid or Bayern Munich. Some football fans actually still want to watch very, very small clubs. But the question then becomes, on what basis do you deliver that product and who you're targeting? targeting how do you position that in the marketplace? So in terms, of, uh, in terms of my conclusions, and I can't actually believe I've delivered a presentation in uh, less than 20 minutes. Normally my presentations go on considerably longer. Um, so that's a success in itself. I've accelerated forward during the, during the pandemic. Um, I don't think we're going back to January 2020. So the day the earth stood still, January 30th, January 31st, we're not going back there. I think things have changed so dramatically. Uh, as we've already said repeatedly, it's been a case of, in, in many inst instances of survival of the fittest. But I think much more than that, the powerful have have. Uh, accumulated even more power and those that are powerless or or, 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 or perhaps feel themselves to be powerless uh, are now in an incredibly difficult position many of them struggling to pay their staff um, many of them wondering again when they can uh, open their doors to spectators no matter what kind of sport they're they're involved in you know whether it's whether it is a football match or even if it's a gym or a swimming pool. So you know, we are rapidly heading now to a, a, a new sport and that new sport looks different. It's not like our old sport. And, and, and as we've said as well, part of that new sport is, is the co-creation. It is around consumers. It is around digital. It is around esports. And that will, as I've already mentioned, it will challenge existing structures, in, existing industrial structures in existing norms and conventions within industries, but I think fundamentally within this, existing issues of governance. governance. And, and, and that really relates to all manner of things, you know, from competition design, right through to how um, uh, money is allocated amongst uh, different participants in a sporting contest. So thank you, thank you for listening. And what I can now do, I hope, is open it to uh, to questions. So if I can come back to the screen and online, there are twenty people. If anybody has any questions, I can uh, I can answer those questions. Okay, so so question from Nicola: Are we going? Are we going to private own closed league in European football? Does it belong to the new normal? Uh, I think it. I think we potentially are, and I think potentially it is. Um, one of the great things about getting old, there aren't that many things great about getting old, but one of the great things about getting old is, is you can remember the past. Um, and if we go back to, to 2000, 2003, 4, 5, uh, some of you will recall that an organisation called the G14 was created in European football. Um, ironically, in, in the end, the G14 wasn't 14 clubs, it was... 18 or 20 clubs, but essentially the G14 was uh, was created to um, to lobby UEFA uh, essentially for more revenue. And, and, and the threat was that if UEFA didn't um, didn't change its financial model, that this group of four, initially 14 clubs would uh, would break away and form its own Super League. So the, the Super League argument, the Super League discussion has been has been ongoing for for at least a decade and a half, if not longer. 
Um, what I found particularly interesting about the, the time of the G14 is, is UEFA got a new president who actually proved, alongside his chief executive, they actually proved to be really adept at um, dealing with the situation. And, and, and people will recall that these two people were, were uh, Platini as president and Infantino as, as, uh, his, as, his, as his sidekick. And essentially what, what, what the two of them did was to say to the bigger clubs, well, you know, we represent everyone. Uh, we represent um, not just you know, Real Madrid and Bayern Munich and Manchester United. We also represent those smaller clubs in Estonia and, and Latvia and uh, you know, elsewhere in Europe. But what Platini and, and Infantino did was to make the cake bigger. So they, re, they reconfigured the UEFA, the UEFA uh, rights model. Um, so all, although effectively the bigger, the bigger clubs and the bigger leagues, leagues didn't get a bigger share of the cake because the cake was bigger, it did mean that they, they were awarded um, uh, uh, more money as a consequence. And so I guess what I'm saying now is you know, that those pressures have risen again. I, th I think the pressures have always been there. They've always been simmering on the back burner. But what the pandemic has done is it's really brought forward these issues again. The only way that I can see, see a breakaway not happening is if we get astute politicians like Platini and Infantino come back again. Now, I'm not suggesting, obviously, Platini and Infantino are about to make a return to UEFA, but I, I do think that unless there is some creative leadership within UEFA, unless there is a, 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 an innovative way of approaching this situation, I think that we, we're now in a period of history where the nature of globalization, the nature of, of economic investments into European football, um, the power of those leading clubs is such that unless UEFA is, is cre able to create a solution, then there will be a breakaway. Um, obviously, then the issue becomes, you know, how, 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 on what basis is that? Does that breakaway take place? You know, who, who governs? Uh, what are the con consequences for domestic leagues and so on and so forth? But you know, I, I, I do genuinely believe we're in the territory of breakaway now. Uh, and it will really depend upon, um, as I say, creative leadership uh, within UEFA to address this situation. Thank you, Nicole, for that question. Other questions? Okay, I'll just take a look in the sidebar. Okay. So some of you, I, uh, I think we've met before, we've spoken before, so welcome. Okay. Okay, so Roman, Roman, don't you think there is potential risk in tax control? You know, Roman, that is a really, uh, that's a really great question. Um, that's a really, really great question, and I'm, I'm glad that you asked it. So, as we all know, and I'm guessing Romain, you're you're from France. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm I work in France, but I'm from Britain. As we know, our countries have struggled to to get. Amazon to pay their taxes, to get Google to pay their taxes, to get Starbucks to pay their taxes. And what, what we know is, is that when you have a transnational corporation operating across multiple boundaries, then the, the power of domestic authorities to, for instance, levy tax upon these transnational corporations is actually very, very difficult. And it shifts the balance of power away from domestic governments towards these transnational corporations. And, and so we have seen these struggles. We've seen these struggles uh, you know, chasing down Amazon, chasing down Starbucks, chasing down uh, Google and, and, and many others. So I was then talking to, to, to somebody over the summer who works in, in, in the sport industry and had knowledge of the the uh, the cast case um, involving City Football Group, or more specifically Manchester City and UEFA. And one of the things that this person said to me was that the whole 
essence of the city football group model in other words having franchises across multiple different territories was a means through which uh taxation and domestic regulations can be avoided and that really resonated with me because i thought right you know that that that, that somehow seems obvious it becomes you know it becomes harder for uefa to govern an organization like city football group when they've got franchises in australia and and china and india and in south america and you then begin to think well okay if you can't if 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 a domestic sorry if a continental football association can't govern these organizations then what hope can a domestic government have to regulate these organizations and and I'm not saying that UEFA has no power or control over City Football Group nor am I saying that the British government doesn't have any power or control over the over City Football Group but I think in both those cases whether it's UEFA or the British government their power and control over City Football Group is greatly diminished because City Football Group op- operates across boundaries and governing transnational corporations is is therefore a big issue this raises the question and i alluded to this in my presentation you so you're then left with who governs and on what basis do they govern because kind of logically you would say that that for transnational sports organizations whether they're in football or in, in any other aspect of sport you know, does that then suggest a role for for fifa for 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 the ioc um or is there a need for a new global body that oversees the the governance of elite professional sport globally worldwide so i think we we are now in the the the, the territory of of because you know personally i can't see the ioc governing transnational corporations and for that matter i can't see fifa governing transnational corporations so then who who's going to govern who who governs what city football group does you know who who governs um what you know what what the chinese government does what the how the chinese investment uh how the chinese government invests in sport so flip it again and you're then into well you know, are we talking about the united nations and if you look at the united nations there's, there's nothing within the united nations current portfolio of activities within its current provision that suggests that the united nations is going to start governing elite professional sport anytime soon but you 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 know, i i can see you know i can foresee i can envisage just as we needed a climate change summit and a climate change agreement to address some of these really important environmental issues that the world faces at some stage in the future given current trends there's going to have to be some kind of global body that uh has an that, that has an over that plays an oversight role in elite professional sport because i think without such an organization and without such oversight then ultimately what we're going to get is the concentration of power in the hands of relatively few to the detriment of the many and for mom, for many of us we will find the consequence we'll find the outcome of that incredibly unpalatable and so uh, this is it we do need new governance and i think one of the one of the new governance one of the new institutions that emerges out of this new form of governance will need to be some kind of transnational um global institution that 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 performs this kind of regulatory or interventionist role that that, that i've just talked about other questions Oh, sorry, I didn't scroll down. And there's more there. Okay. So I'm going back to Roman again. At first, my reaction watching current football without support, as I thought, was sad. Was sad and I thought at first, my reaction watching current football. Sad. This is not football like that, but finally, it was up. yeah roman thank you for 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 that observation um it's it's an interesting again it's an interesting question because 
I was born and brought up uh, going to go to football matches. So my parents said, you know, you go to a football match and you're there in the crowd and and, and you experience the crowd. And, and this was at a time when you really got very little opportunity to watch live football on air. And so someone's main engagement, I mean, my main point of engagement as a kid was actually going to a stadium with other fans and, and watching a game. And, and that for me was football. And, and you know, even now that's incredibly evocative. You know, I can smell the cigarette smoke and I can smell the, uh, the, the halftime drinks and I can hear the noises. And, and so that was very much the product. And, and if you look at the traditional sport marketing literature, fans are very much presented, presented as being a component part of the sport product. So in other words, along with all the other fans and with, with the teams and with the, the, the club organizing the, the game, we're co-creating, we're co-creating the noise, we're co-creating the atmosphere. And so for me, that, that, that always was the sport product. But of course, what's happened over the last 30 years in particular is, is we, we've, lived, we've lived sports, not just football, but I think we've lived sports as a televised commodity. And so you know, many of us have been used to sitting at home watching TV, possibly not even going to games. We have, of course, I guess, you know, become used to seeing people in, in the stands, even if we're watching on TV, seeing people in the stands, uh, hearing the noises, and, and, and that all plays a part in, in, in our consumption of, of, of the sport. But of course, what, what, what we've seen um, I, really, two things. I, I think the first thing is is uh, we've seen new sports beginning to emerge, and and, and you know, we think about esports, and we think about FIFA, and we think about cry, crowd noises, which are artificial, and and so there is a generation of, of sports fans, or a generation of people who are engaging with sport now, who are, for example, used to artificial sounds. You've also got to keep in mind as well over the last. 10 to 15 years and people have said this several times that that many sports actually don't need fans anymore in other words they, they don't need people in the stadiums they make more money from broadcasting um, than than they do from ticket sales and 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 the counter to that as as, as some people say well you know, don't charge people to be to, to enter games just let them in free if you if 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 you know, clubs like the, the top Premier League clubs are making most of their money from broadcasting deals, then just let fans in for free. So I think it's a, it's a really interesting one that, that, again, what the pandemic has done is really to fast forward a whole bunch of issues because there was already, already this discussion, you know, should, they, should we let fans in for free? And, you know, there are other forms of sport like FIFA, FIFA console gaming where there aren't really any fans there. You know, it's competitors together. And, what I find somewhat ironic is is that if you do look at something like League of Legends, and we mentioned this earlier, is um, last year when the League of Legends World Championship final took place in Shanghai, it was taking place in a venue that 35,000 people could go in live and watch. So it wasn't a purely um, online form of consumption. It, it, it was you know, still face-to-face -face in, 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 in part. And so I guess, Romain, in response to your question and, and, and in the light of my kind of monologue, I think we're, we're heading now to, we're heading to quite segmented ways of consuming and, 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 and I also think hybrid forms of consuming as well. You know, and, and as we already know, many of us will sit in a football match with thousands of other people, but looking at our phones at the same time. And I think that kind of hybrid consumption with, with different forms of consumption, maybe different in different places, different times, motivated by different things, um, will be the picture that begins to emerge. And, and But I think certainly it won't be a case of, you know, like when I was a kid, you went, you watched the game, you had no phone, you didn't, you, you, you weren't looking at you know, your, your phone and, and getting content. There might be a little old guy behind you with an earpiece listening to the radio, but apart from that, you were dedicated in terms of your consumption. You were dedicated at that, that time and place. So, yeah, I think we will see some hybrid forms of more hybrid forms of consumption emerging. That's the short answer, I think. We got other questions. All oh, right, we have got other questions. Frederick.
I actually tweeted Frederick a little earlier that um, yesterday in China there was Shanghai Marathon, Chengdu Marathon, and another one. I can't remember the third one, but there were thirty thousand people participated in marathons in China yesterday. So the good news is that you know, there there is light. There is light there. If we look to China, there is light. You know, potentially, we can see the Paris Marathon. We can see the London Marathon at some stage in the future coming back again. But I think what it also did was to, for me, when I saw this tweet, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, I I think you know we we three, four, five, six months behind China. So we we're talking about you know kind of April, May. June next year before we see a, a kind of uh, a return to normal. Um, so I think you know, there is very grand, there are grounds for optimism, but I think that there are things that that need to happen before. And so I'm just going back to. So I'm just reading your question again, uh, Frederick. Um, so do I believe in general terms? Oh, in general terms, yes and no. I think obviously elite professional athletes, given the level of scientific training and support that they have, the the analytics that go around their performance, the facilities that they have at their disposal, um, their their levels of performance, their standards of performance will not significantly dip. But as I'm sure you, you know, and, and many other people who here who've played sport will know that that there is no substitute for real match conditions real race conditions and and i think the question that you you've raised raised does better bigger and in and just kind of raise an interesting issue which is at next year's olympic games in, in tokyo how many world records will we see being broken because you know obviously part of us with we're going to be saying well hey you know, the, the athletes haven't been overtaxed so they, they haven't been overexerted. They've not been under huge pressure. Their their body should be in good shape. Their injuries should have been dealt with, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but at the same time, you know, they've not performed in 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 high level competition for for a long time. And and so, you know, can we expect elite professional athletes to go from zero to a hundred kilometers an hour just like this? So I I think you you ask a really interesting question, Frederick, about uh, about what will happen when sport resumes. Um, because I think there will be this tension between being fresh, but also not being match ready or race ready. Mehdi, Mehdi how Japan could adapt to next to considering change, mentioning impact to tourism? Well, I think Mehdi, in response to your, your observation about Paris, let's just see. This time last year, we didn't know this was going to happen. So by twenty, by the time twenty twenty four comes, who knows? Who knows what will have happened? So I think we do need to reserve judgment on Paris twenty twenty four. I think clearly in terms of, of not just Paris, but um, also Qatar twenty twenty two in France as well. We got the Rugby Union World Cup in twenty twenty three. Contingency planning, having a plan B, is now a big thing. What I think a lot of sports organisations were caught. They, they were caught in a difficult position because they didn't have a plan B. They they didn't they didn't have a, a contingency plan in place, or certainly well developed contingency plans. So one one of the things I hope sport has learned is is the need always to have a plan B. The need always to to, to have contingency planning in place. I think a lot of what you what we what we're talking about will be dictated by um, whether or not a vaccine is available. Um, and how quickly that vaccine can be rolled out and, and uh, who will get it and why they will get it and, and what, the, what it will enable them to do. Uh, my, my feeling is that if you're talking about big venues full of people, 100% capacity utilisation, we're at least 12 months away from that. And, and, and my view would be probably even about a year and a half, maybe even two years away from it. So come Tokyo next year. Um, one would imagine that we're going to be looking at venues operating at, if we're lucky, 75% capacity. I would imagine more like 50% capacity. And and so then, obviously, in terms of crowd management, safety management, there are going to be a bunch of issues. But I think also for, for the IOC and for other organizations is, is how do you build engagement globally 
amongst sports fans at a time when perhaps only 50% of those who want to go into a venue can go into a venue. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about the future. I think things will get better. Things will be different. But I do think it will take some time to do it. Uh, Jeffrey, thank you, Future of Esports. I'm going to go back to being uh, an old man again because for, for me, I was, I was conditioned. I was born and brought up. I was conditioned to consume my sport in a, in a, in a particular way. You go to a stadium, you watch on TV. But I've, 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 got, a, I've got a son. You know, and the way, the way that my son consumes is different to me. Um, you know, he, he, he was, he's never known life without the internet. Uh, you know, he, he's never known having a, a mobile device without Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat on it. So the, the ways in which he consumes, the way in which, ways in which he engages with the world um, are very different to the way in which people like me consume. And, and I think one of the things that, that, that I actually find quite uh, irritating, dismissive, arrogant, is when, when people like me, you know, middle-class, middle-aged white guys, Say to younger people, right, go to a, go to a stadium and, and, and watch football for 90 minutes. Now, you're going to sit there passively and do nothing for 90 minutes. You're just going to watch. You know, that's what you do. You know, I think that's quite, that's quite naive and arrogant and dismissive and because you know, pe teenagers and, and, and people in their, in their 20s and, and obviously you know, just kids now, you know, kids who are five, six years old in 10 years' time, you know, how they're going to be consuming. And, and we have to adapt. People like me and sports that are delivered by people like me, historically have been delivered by people like me, we've got to adapt, we've got to change, we've got to, we've got to transform. And I think this is all part of what this webinar series is about. It's about transformation and acceleration. And, and you know, if, if you think about it, it's truly, uh, it is truly bizarre, or it seems truly bizarre, even to me, that if you were to, I'll give you a great example. Um, test match cricket. Now, obviously, uh, you know, a British guy, a British guy working in a French business school, is always going to have difficulty with cricket. So, I do have a schizophrenic relationship with cricket. But for those of you who are not um, familiar with cricket, international cricket takes the takes the form of, of it takes various different forms. One of the forms is is that uh, you you have test matches between nations so india australia england new zealand west indies and various others um these these last five days and at the end of that five days there is a strong possibility that there's not going to be a winner so you think about that in current day terms and for me personally i don't have five days to sit and watch cricket if i've got five days you know, just to kind of relax, I'm going to stay in bed or, you know, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to surf the web or, you know, I'm going to read a book or what. I'm not going to sit and watch cricket for five days. You know, what the hell? What the hell is that all about? And, and yet that is the old world. And I think it's an illustration of, you know, go back 50 years ago and cricket might have, cricket over five days might have worked very, very well. Fast forward to 2020, 2021 very soon, you know, five days, five days watching cricket really doesn't suit many people we've already seen some transformation and, and and for those of you who are unfamiliar with indian premier league cricket um i would recommend that you look at indian premier league cricket because that really is a i think that is really a, a really great example of, of of how a sport can transform itself it can become different it can be played in a different way it can appeal to different consumers it can be uh, 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 the content is shared in different ways the commercial model is different but you know going back to to, to jeffrey's question about esports i i think that esports are here to stay and although people like me people who may look like me and sound like me and have positions similar to me might say, well, you know, it's it's still all about football and rugby and cricket and motor racing. And I think the future of esports is is much more profoundly altering 
for sport than, than many people might realize. Uh, we, what have we got? So we've got about 10 minutes left. I've got another question from Romain. Does this empiric situation create a Netflix, Netflix of sport? And then you talk about betting. Um, I think the Netflix, the, 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 at the moment, this, this notion of a Netflix for sport is almost like, you know, this is the golden egg. Um, this, this is, you know, this is alchemy. The person who can, or the corporation that can create this next Netflix, Netflix for sport will be, will be a very rich person. Uh, or at least that, that seems to be the, the prevailing view that, that, that you know, whoever can crack this will, will, um, will we'll make a lot of money that's that's where we're heading uh, i know that uh the has, has has kind of positioned itself as a netflix for sport unfortunately for the the uh the pandemic came along and and that may well be a big issue and that that is proven actually it is proving to be a big issue for the they, they've had some considerable financial difficulties this year um, but I think again, as if we look, if we look to, if we look to Disney, we look to Netflix, we look to Amazon. Uh, you have amazing things happening in China. I think around Alibaba and Tencent, um, uh, similar such developments. And, and keep that in mind. You know, it, it, the Netflix Netflix for sport may not actually be American or European. You know, it could be Chinese. It could be Saudi Arabian. It could be Indian. So again, I think if you look at some of the investments that have been made into Reliance Geo, the Indian uh, telecoms provider this year, uh, th there are there, this, this is a company that's growing very, very quickly. And so it's not inconceivable that you know we may not we may not get a Netflix of of, of sports. We might get an Alibaba of sports, or we may not get a Reliance Geo of sports. And so. You know, we live in turbulent times. We live in dynamic times. I know a lot of people are concerned about how things will turn out. But for me personally, we're living in one of the most incredible periods in history, one of the most exciting periods in history, where some of the most profound changes, certainly as they relate to sport, are taking place. Um, and I do think we are heading towards a Netflix for sport. But as I say, I, I don't necessarily believe it will be a Netflix for sport. It could be an Alibaba for sport. It could be a Reliance Geo for, a Geo for sport. It could be a Saudi Arabian public investment fund for sport. Who knows? OK, so time for one more question. Use it or lose it. Any more? So I'll count you down. So 10, 9, 8, 7. Ah, there's one coming here. What would you advise advise to young professionals who want to enter the industry this year? Uh, thank you, Frederick. Um, I would say several things. <laughs> Do all the things that you would have done anyway, like be professional and get some experience if you can. And that experience, I don't mean go and work in sport, you know, volunteer in sport, you know, go, go, and, go and perform a voluntary role. And there are lots of things you can be doing volunteering in sport right now that will help um, will help uh, add some flourishes to your, to, your, to your CV, to your resume. Um, as, we, as always, What's going to get you the job is is you've got to think about how 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 does what you have as a person align with the job description and pers person specification that these organizations are um, making available when job announcements are posted. And the reason I say this is I, the, the advice I always give to my students is don't don't just have a standard letter and don't just have a standard cv in my view you've got to you've got to tailor every cv and every letter that you that you that you use when you apply for a job so instead of having a standard cv and a standard standard letter and sending these out to 100 companies speculatively it's better to target 10 positions 
and then for each of those 10 positions, you know, research the organization, research the job, research the challenges that they face, research some of the problems that they're having. And then in your covering letter, talk about the company as though you, you, know, you, you know who they are and what they do and you understand them but also offer them some solutions to the challenges they face, offer them some solutions to the problems they have. Now, it may well be that, that you know, they're, 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 not, they're not necessarily solutions that the organization is going to use, but what you're doing is you're, you're differentiating yourself from other candidates by demonstrating that you've taken the time and the care to find out about this organization and to find out some of the issues it faces. But also, it, 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 it adds some value. It shows that you have a sense of how you're going to add value to their business. Because ultimately, what you've got to keep in mind, you know, no matter who it is or what it is, whether it's the Ferrari F1 team, the Olympics, you know, whatever, you know, the bottom line for pretty much all of them is, is to make money. And, and, and particularly in this era of the pandemic, what they're going to be looking for is is people who can help them add value to their businesses, people who can make money for them. And so what you have to very clearly accentuate is, is how, how and where you think you can contribute to the long term financial sustainability of, uh, of, of the organizations that you're applying to. I do accept that some of you may not be applying to, you know, you, you don't apply to a business, you, 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 you may apply to, I don't know, a, a grassroots sports project, or you may apply to a government department. Um, in that case, what I would recommend that you, you do is that you take a look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and, and I think they provide a good insight into um, some of the things that all sport organizations should be now thinking about. So, but certainly you know, some of those, you know, if we think about sport and the sport and the environment, if we think about sport and gender equality, we think about um, sport and Black Lives Matter or sport and activism. You know, those, those United Nations development goals, I think, provide a helpful insight into understanding the kinds of insights and competences that you will be expected to have. The, the only thing, the thing that I would say is, is mid-year, I spoke to a pretty large recruiter, big organization, global organization, working in sport. And one of their senior directors said to me, 2021 is going to be a great year. And, and he said that for several reasons. Obviously, there, were, there, there are all of those events in 2021 that were going to take place anyway. But you've also got the UEFA Euros. You've also got the Olympics. Very soon after that, you're going to have the Beijing Winter Games in uh, February 2022. And, and he said that he thinks that there'll be a bounce back as a consequence. But also you've got to keep in, keep in mind that there's going to be significant pent up demand. And as some of, some of you have probably seen from supermarkets and shops, and every time there's a lockdown, when the shops open back up again, there's a sudden rush. There are queues. There is pent up demand. And, and most people tend to think that the same type of pent up demand is there in sports as well. And so we have to believe, you know, people like you and me, Frederick, um, have to believe that in the future, you know, that, that it is bright. It is optimistic. There will be jobs. There will be roles. Um, but as I say, don't just take my word for it. As this particular individual I was speaking to, he also feels that the future will be bright as well. Uh, Mehdi. Hard to manage this new change in the passion we have for it, but sport culture. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. Um, and it's, it's, I'll be brutally honest, uh, I just really haven't sought out sport since its return. Um, if I think about World Cups, whenever a World Cup comes, so I'm a huge, as you probably gathered, I'm a huge football fan. When, I, when the World Cup comes, I get genuinely, genuinely excited. And, and, and that's not because I'm an England fan, because if I was an England fan, um, I wouldn't get excited about the World Cup at all. But I just like seeing great players playing for great teams, scoring great goals in great tournaments. You know, it's, for me, I just get, I, it's just brilliant. And I just feel so excited and I get genuinely. And yet for the last what, three, four, five months since sport returned? I'm not really bothered. 
Now, what I do, what I don't know, what I don't know inside myself is that is that a long term change, or is it just because you know, I don't want I don't want to watch a game with with no no crowds there and. You know, I, have I got other concerns? Yeah, I'm thinking about the pandemic, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about having to go to the supermarket on a Saturday afternoon because it's crowded. So, you know, there's a lot of there are a lot of intangibles in my head that I would need to work through to understand this. But I agree with you; it's it's just not the same. And and I think if, I think one of the interesting for me, what's happened throughout the pandemic is for most of us particularly console gamers and those of us who spend time on our phones, you know, on social media. It was almost as though we could survive without people. And and I think even I've realized, um, and probably most of you have, is, is you can't survive without people. You know, there is actually something about being physically close to someone and shouting and cheering and sharing, having a drink while you talk about the game or talk about the race or whatever it might be. Um, and so yeah, I would agree with you, Metty. It's it's just not been the same, and I hope it does. I, I hope those feelings inside me do come back, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Okay, so that's uh, an hour. Uh, at that point, can I thank you all very much for being here? Thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you for sending in questions and comments, and uh, wherever you are. I send you my best wishes, uh, your families as well. I hope you can stay safe and stay healthy. And maybe next year, you know, I'll see you somewhere for a game when when the world's back to normal. Maybe. Otherwise, you got my uh, Twitter, uh, Twitter, uh, Twitter tag, your yeah, Twitter handle. You you got my email address. If you want to get get in touch, you're welcome to. So thank you, thank you for being here.